Uh, each week we uh, have a time where someone from our community shares kind of a thought for the day, from, you know, maybe a book they read, um, you know, some idea they're working through, maybe their journey to free thought. And uh, today, our community moment presenter is Chris Cowbell Velasquez. Chris. <laughs> Thanks for that intro, Mike. <laughs> the original title of this talk was going to be more cowbell, but somebody stole that idea. <laughs> so I toyed with the idea of maybe even more cowbell, but um, they didn't want to be too redundant. So and I've had an idea going through my mind ever since I watched that debate with Ken and Ann and Bill Nye about why do smart people believe goofy things? And you know, it's easy to like stand there and point the finger at somebody and say, you know, you're you're delusional. You're you you're not right in the head. There's something wrong. You know, why don't you get it? And so, and but I realized that I was in that same position at one point in my life. And so I'm gonna gonna talk a little bit about that. I'm gonna talk about autobiographically. How did I get to the point? A lot of times people come up and talk about their deconversion and how they left the church. I'm gonna tell you how I ended up in church, okay? So anyway, when we take, you know, how many of y'all saw that debate with, all right, good, at least half of you have seen that. If not, you know, you might wanna, if you haven't seen it, go on YouTube, skip about halfway through and go to the Q&A section, because that's where, <laughs> that's where Kenny Ham really gets it. So, um, and how is it you can believe this cognitive dissonance, you know, the kind of, you're, you're, we're trying to rationalize what we see in the world and what we see experimentally and scientifically and still try to hold on to this idea of a young earth, 6,000 years old, even though there's fossils, you've got stars that are far away, billions of light years away that we can see, we know that light took billions of years to get here, so it wasn't like it, you know, just and you know, and people have tried to reconcile on all these things, creationism, and and in order to do that, because there was somebody in my life who I was close to who what is still continues to be a young Earth creationist today, even though she has a master's in engineering, has taken geology classes, still the idea that the Bible has to be one hundred percent true or else it falls apart like a house of cards. Well. <laughs> that might actually be the case. Um, is that that um, you know somehow that important? That to keep holding on to that particular idea is so important that you're willing to put up with cognitive dissonance and be able to compartmentalize that. You're also able to put up with, ignore the logical fallacies. Okay, there's so many logical fallacies that go into this. I mean, you've got the you know the the argument from authority, basically. You know, God said it. I believe it. That settles it. How many of you have heard that? Okay. So authority. Okay. Tradition. The argument from tradition. Where, you know, well, this is the way we've always done it. This is what we always believe by, you know, grandpa and great grandpa. And so so there's, you've got that as sort of a force that's making you want argument from ignorance. Well, I don't understand. So you know, somebody did it, right? And the universe got here one way or another. So. You know, that, that you got these arguments that you're willing that normally under spec, under under you know normal you know these people have day jobs they actually have to go and you know you know do do things and and they're you know people who are young earth creatures are just like you and me okay I mean in their in their normal life but they've managed to compartmentalize all of this thought that they have okay and you know they and they don't understand that they're using the circular reasoning of like. Well, the Bible says it's true, so the Bible's got to be true because it says it's true, right? So you've got this circular reasoning going on in your mind. And, it, and, and the basis for all this is you've got an argument for special pleading. What special pleading is, is I'm going to make an exception for this particular case. You know, I know that I can never walk on water. Nobody I know can walk on water, but somehow 2,000 years ago there was this guy and he was able to walk on water. This is great, you know? Well, I mean, you can only make that argument if you're making a special exemption for this particular thing, even though it applies everywhere else. And so that special pleading argument is not a very convincing argument to most of us in this room. You know, I, I'm, I'm assuming everybody here is fairly intelligent. One, I'll say one uh, 
way heuristically to kind of see intelligence is like take a look at a person's education. I'm just curious, how many people have ever had a college class that they got a grade in? Raise your hand. I love taking calls. It's like almost 100% here. Okay, now we're, we're gonna raise the stakes. How many people have a master's degree or, or better, higher, master's degree? Wow, okay. Look at how many people have master's degrees. How many people have either a JD, an MD, or a PhD, or some other postgraduate? Okay, look at this, look at this. I mean, this is, this is incredible. We've got a lot of intelligent people here, okay? Now, if you take a look at Ken Ham, he's just as intelligent. He's got graduate degrees, and there are a lot of other people like Michael Behe and many other people who have, who have actually subscribed to YEC, even though they've got the same educational credentials that we have, okay? And so, that brings me to the idea of mistakes. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about my mistakes. Um, back when, you know, if, if, has anybody ever been to despair.com? Demotivators, okay? <laughs> yeah, they're the ones that spoof, you know, those stupid motivational posters they have in the HR department of every cube farm in America. Okay, and the, the, my favorite one is called Mistakes, and it's got a picture of this sinking ship, and it reads, it could be that the purpose of your life is only to serve as a warning sign to others. <laughs> so, here's where I'm gonna talk about how my life can serve as a warning sign to anybody else who might get duped into some of these delusions, okay? I mean, I was mathematically precocious as a child, and you know I believed in Santa Claus still. Okay, but at seven years old, I had gained enough mathematical ability to actually calculate out how long. Because I figured, how long is Santa Claus going to spend at everybody's house? Okay, and and so I I, I did the math, and I realized he was only going to he had to visit. 10,000 houses every single second. And so, and my mom and dad, had, you know, even though my friends were telling me there was no Santa Claus, right? My, my, and my mom and dad were still, you know, because I had a younger sister and younger brother, so they were trying to keep up the roots. So, so I said, Mom, how is it that possible that Santa Claus can visit 10,000 or 100,000 houses every single second? And then finally she had to break down and say, Santa Claus isn't real. That's just mom. Just, you know, your, your friends are right now, yeah, it's just us. And like, oh. And of course, then I, I made another connection. So, so that means there's no Easter Bunny, right? And, yeah, and, and, and Tooth Fairy, you've been putting those, those coins that are my name. Yeah, yeah. And, and that whole stuff about God, that's not real either, right? Is this one mom took me aside and told me what the difference between an atheist and agnostic and how she was an agnostic. And I said, it doesn't make any sense. I guess I'm an atheist. So I was an atheist at seven. I decided that. But I didn't have, I, I had no exposure, real exposure to religion. So it was no big deal, you know? So I just went through my life. I figured experimentation, just fine. You know, got into MIT and started studying chemistry and when I was in, as an undergraduate, I ran into somebody who was a smart person who believed in reflexology and iridology, which if you don't know, iridology means you can look at the iris of somebody's eye and be able to tell different things about their body. And yeah, it's very spooky sounding there. And you're looking at all these different threads in, in reflexology where they have a map of the foot. You see, there's a foot. And it actually maps to different parts of your body. And if you press in the right place of your foot, it's actually going to be able to cleanse your colon or something like that. It's that kind of, that kind of thing. And it's like, I was able to, and, but I kind of liked this girl. So I was, I was willing to kind of accept a little bit of this, this crazy stuff for a little while until and everything worked out. And every, you know, it didn't work out. And so I, I really realized it was BS. Okay. Then, when I was in graduate school over at Northwestern, um, I had a girlfriend, and we were living together, and she had this weird dream, and then she had this deja vu experience on the subway where it was like it was coming true. And this was a little bit disconcerting because I was thinking, you know, how could, you, how could this happen? It's like, what's going on out there? You know, how do I explain this? And 
then later on, I was working in a laboratory in the tech building in Northwestern, and she had a dream on Sunday night that there was an explosion in the tech building. And so on Monday, she told me, and she also told members of her own class about this dream, about the explosion in the tech building. Well, it turned out on Wednesday, just two days later, there was a massive explosion in the tech building. And so it's like this coincidence, it's like this is not a coincidence, she saw this happening. And so I started believing, maybe there is something to the supernaturalism. Maybe there is, and so that's, that's kind of how I was getting primed for religion, see? You start seeing coincidences and start saying, well, it's gotta be more than a coincidence. And so we're ascribing that agency to that, that the fact that she saw it, she predicted it, and then it happened. And, but I was smart. I grabbed my lab books and ran out of there. So I didn't lose any of my research. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, so, and then when I was uh, doing a postdoc at UNC Chapel Hill, the, uh, she had a co-worker who was always asking her to go to church. He, he went to a Pentecostal church and you know, a couple of times, you know, you know how they try to evangelize. He was trying to be nice about it. He was a smart guy, you know, he had his own master's degree. And um, so I said, let's go to church for a birthday. And so, so when I took her to church, we sat down and if you've been, you know, people sing, just like, you know, church. And then, then the pastor got up to the podium and he says, you know, I was up all night. About 11.30, the Holy Spirit told me to rip up my speech and start over because something special was gonna happen that day. And he gave a talk about um, how we're supposedly connected to Father God and how it's a mirror of our relationship with our fathers and I have to get, and my relationship with my father was not very good at that point. I felt like I was you know, dishonoring him. I hadn't talked to him in years. I really need to get back together. And so, you know, it actually caused this change in my life where I finally had to humble myself to my dad and, you know, make, you know we had, had to you know, talk things out after silence for years. And we did it. And so I looked at this as a change in my life. And so this positive change that happened in my life, I started with scribing the agency that somehow God was in charge of all of that. And so that's when I started bringing in all of this. So I was connecting dots that weren't there, you see? And the thing is, I think, you know, and from my education and, you know, the way I speak, you know, I'm fairly intelligent. Why would I get suckered into something like that? And I think there's a lot of things that go feed into that. One of them is the desire for acceptance. We really want to feel accepted. We want to feel like we're part of a group, that we're appreciated, that we belong to something greater than ourselves. Church provides that. I think we provide that here in Oasis, don't we? Yeah. Can they get a rock yeah. yeah. okay, so. and, and we also are looking for safety. You know, we're looking, you know, we, we, want, we want to think that we're going to be immortal, okay? And I don't know what everybody believes here. Everybody's got their own idea, you know, it's, it's like what, you know, Lewis was talking about opinions. <laughs> I won't go any further than that. Uh, and so I just want to say, show this as a warning sign that how you have to be a little bit careful, put your shields up, because it, could, it happened to me, it can happen to you too. Just be careful and don't let your life serve as a warning to others. <laughs> Thanks.